Hi and welcome back to the channel. Yep, still in lockdown, but it looks like we're going to be getting out of it soon. Uh, anyway, I thought I'd do a couple of Australian films this time. Now, it's easy for people to think that Australian films and Australian cinema started with the Ausploitation boom of the 1970s, and that's definitely not the case. There's about 70 years of history before the Ausploitation boom. In silent film days, and right from the beginning of cinema, Australia was punching well above its weight. It was doing musicals in the 1930s, it was doing silent films, sometimes with very, very complex plots and very complex natures. And then in the 1930s, the state governments, which were in charge of the film industries to a, a great extent, were kind of wined and dined and seduced by Hollywood studios to show their product much more prominently on Australian screens. And so the Australian film industry, which couldn't compete on that kind of level, died out in the 1930s and 1940s. Things became difficult, of course, because of you know, Germany and Japan, really. And so the film industry was on hold there. But after the war, Ealing Studios in England turned their eyes to Australia and decided that they wanted to send a film unit out there, a guy called Harry Watt and a few other people, and start telling some Australian stories on film. They did it for about nine years. Actually, ten years. Last one was The Siege of Pinchgut. But before that, right at the very start, Harry Watt had a very difficult time getting a movie made in Australia. Now, I'm very lucky because I've got this book that I picked up, called the penguin film companion number nine and the interesting thing about it is that harry watt did an essay about his early history the first three years of his film making in australia actually the first two years and it's got a really great title to it as well the the little essay it's the one right at the start and it's called you start from scratch in Australia. You start from scratch in Australia. And it talks about the two movies, actually three movies, that Harry Watt made right at the start of his tenure in Australia. I'm going to be talking about two of them. They both have the same star. They're both very, very Australian stories. And even though to look at them on a poster or something like that, you could be mistaken for thinking that they're versions of a Western, but they're not. These movies are not quite Hollywood Westerns. So Harry Watt rocked up in Sydney after quite a long journey from England, 12,000 miles, and decided he was going to look for stories. So he looked for some stories around there were only two guys making feature films in Australia at the time. One of them was the great Charles Chavel, and the other was Ken G. Hall. And between Chavel and Hall, they had taken all the experienced technicians with them. They were using them on their own projects. So Harry had a problem there. He also had another problem because he needed a camera called a Mitchell. You need a couple of Mitchell cameras to do a feature film in Australia. You've got to remember this is a black and white. This is um, Academy ratio. This isn't widescreen. This isn't Technicolor. This isn't Panavision. This isn't Super Aeroflex cameras. And so he went around looking for a Mitchell camera. He found two of them, one of which was locked in a businessman's safe as settlement for a bad debt. So Harry got himself two cameras and then decided he needed to find a story. So he went around to various government instrumentalities. He talked to different government departments and the ministers for government departments. And one day Harry was talking to the Minister of Food. Now, during the war and during the post-war rationing, the Minister for Food was a big deal. But this guy was boring. Harry just listened to the guy reeling off statistics and then he heard something that was really interesting. When the guy said, in 1942, we moved 100,000 head of cattle halfway across the country to keep them away from the Japanese. And Harry went, that's my story. And so he did his homework, and the story was perfect for cinema. It didn't have to be tweaked, it didn't have to be rewritten, it didn't have to be twisted into shape. It was an innately cinematic story that nobody knew about, and that became the movie we know as The Overlanders, starring Chips Rafferty, Peter Pagan, 
and a bunch of other people that you don't really know, including a woman called June Blue, who turned up in the second movie I'm going to talk about, Bitter Springs. So there was a big logistical problem. He had to film it in the Northern Territory. Everybody around Sydney was saying, oh, you can get all different kinds of Australian landscapes within 50 miles of Sydney, which isn't true. And so Harry decided he needed to film it in the Northern Territory where a lot of the action would take place. In 1942, the Japanese were driving invincibly southward from Singapore. It seemed inevitable that next into their hands would fall the Northern Territory of Australia, largest undeveloped region in the world, with a million head of cattle and a population of only 5,000 whites. This is the story of one mob and of the people who drove it across a continent. And so he enlisted the army because it's after the war and you know the army was pretty well equipped with various stuff and a whole bunch of state and territory governments to help him out with it. The story's a really interesting one. In the movie, Chips Rafferty plays a guy called Dan McAlpine, who is working as a cattleman for a meat processing company in Wyndham at the northern part of Western Australia. Now, the Japanese have just bombed Wyndham, they've bombed Broome, they've bombed Darwin, and it's, the company has decided that what it needs to do is get everybody out of there. It needs to get all the machinery onto a ship so the Japanese can't use it if they invade Australia, which was a definite possibility at the time. And the order comes through for the company to shoot all the cattle. Now, Dan's a cattleman. He doesn't want to do that, so he suggests that he moves the cattle all the way across the continent, through the Northern Territory, across Western Australia, through the Northern Territory, across Queensland, to the coast where there's some good grazing land and they can be processed for the war effort. The company agrees to it and Dan gets a group of drovers, including a few indigenous stockmen. And You'll come with me, won't you, Jackie? Where do, boss? Across three states, Western Australia, Northern Territory and Queensland to the sea. How long on the road, boss? For a year, maybe two. Okay, I'll come with you. Wait till I tell the missus. I'll be back in five minutes. And he also gets a family who run horses. Um, the wife, the daughters, and the husband come along. The wife does the cooking and takes care of the camp while the guys are herding the cattle. And he gets a couple of green people. He gets a kind of con man from the East Coast. And he also gets a young sailor who is fed up with having ships bomb from under him. So decides to join the cattle drive. And they start moving cattle all the way across the country. And that's some tough territory. You get, you've got to go from waterhole to waterhole. You've got a whole bunch of different natural perils. Some of their horses get killed by poisonous weed they eat. And so they've got to round up and train a whole bunch of wild horses. There are crocodile infested rivers to cross. There's just any number of different problems. And there are dry water bores as well. So the water holes don't have any water in it. And cattle won't survive for more than three days without water. So there are all these issues that come along as a part of the narrative of this movie. And then, of course, you've got the iconic character of Chips Rafferty, who was six foot four, a big lanky guy. Chips Rafferty wasn't his real name either. He was born from a middle class family in Broken Hill, but lived in Sydney for a while as a wine merchant. His real name was John William Pilbean Goffage which wasn't really going to play in the cinema, so he took on the sobriquet of Chips Rafferty and became a very well-known and well-loved Australian actor right up to till his death in 1970-71. His last big film was Wake in Fright, where he played the copper. So Chips Rafferty, all through his career, was pressing for Australian films. He tried to get a made. He got a number of them made himself, including The Phantom Stockman and King of the Coral Sea, and a few others, but the governments and the people who should have been helping him never helped him very much. He really pushed all his life for Australian cinema, and I think he should be more recognised for that. So The the Overlanders is a, just a great film, a great action film. You learn a hell of a lot about cattle droving. You learn a lot about the way the Northern Territory looks. A lot of it was filmed around Alice Springs. They had a stampede they had to film, but they had to do it in a giant corral, basically, because otherwise their cattle would go away. They bought a thousand head of cattle for the filming of this movie. 
Now, Harry Watt had a hell of a lot of trouble with this. He had to wait for the heavy equipment and the horses for two weeks because they were coming from the south by rail. And it took two weeks by train to transport all their gear. They had to be flown in on um, Australian Army Dakota aircraft to various locations. It was just an enormous logistical problem that you couldn't have done without the assistance of the Australian government and the army. And it really pays off as a film. It's a film about people trying to save what they have and trying to deny an enemy invader of resources. There are just so many different levels to this. It's not by any means a fantastically acted film, but it is exciting. There are a couple of stampedes. There's beautiful locations. It's a terrible shame that this movie wasn't able to be made in colour because the colours of the outback are enormously beautiful. I've flown over a lot of the country where they filmed this stuff and the reds and the ochres and the yellows and the soil and the trees and all of that are beautiful. I've been to the Flinders Ranges where the second movie, Bitter Springs, was filmed. And that country is wonderful too. It's um, People tend to think of Australia as being the bit around the edge, but the centre of Australia is wonderfully beautiful. That's why I'm wearing my ABC Darwin hat, because Darwin's in the Northern Territory, and I talk to them every week about movies. Just to finalise on The Overlanders, it is available through Umbrella Entertainment, and it's on Blu-ray, and you also get a second feature on the Blu-ray, which is pretty cool. An American Western filmed in Australia called Kangaroo, which is such an imaginative title, starring Maureen O'Hara, Peter Lawford, and Richard Boone. Now, in spite of that cast, it's a shit movie, and it basically adds nothing at all to an understanding of Australia or Indigenous, even though it does prominently feature them in a number of sequences. It's a simplistic piece of shit movie, and it's just put on as an extra to show the different ways that Australia had been portrayed in the 1950s in cinema. So the second movie, Bitter Springs, is a much more interesting, a much more complex film in so many ways. In this one, Chips Rafferty, with his family, his wife's played by Jean Blue from Overlanders in this one, pays 80 quid in Adelaide to get a parcel of land in the northern part of South Australia from the... Ter this was set in 1900, so it would have been from the South Australian government because Australia didn't federate into a nation until 1901. So he's playing a guy called Wally King. And the King family, his son's played by Charles Bud Tingwell, who went on to become an icon of Australian cinema, travel 800 miles into northern South Australia to get this patch of land that the government's given them. And what they don't know is that the only water on the land is owned by an indigenous tribe. The police trooper who they meet there, played by Michael Pate, who turned up in all sorts of American films in the 1950s, tells them there are three ways to handle the local population. You either move them out, you ease them out, or you learn to live with them. Call the natives that live there the Karagani. Spring's been their tribal home for a thousand years, two perhaps, since the time we were savages anyway thousand years. One day a bloke walks into the government land office in Adelaide, 800 miles away, bangs down 80 quid, they hand him a bit of stamped paper, Karagani haven't got a tribal home anymore. And that kind of three-step process we see all the way through the movie. Now there's no going back for Wally. If he goes back, he's got nothing to go back to. He wants to build a sheep station, he's got a whole bunch of sheep that they heard of the 800 miles, two bitter springs, he wants to build a future for his family and the people he takes with him, one of whom is a young Scottish carpenter played by Gordon Jackson, the iconic English actor, and a kind of dodgy guy who's got a young son, played by Australian music hall comedian Tommy Trinder, who was very popular in England at the time. So this motley crew turn up there and encounter the Indigenous people. And there are cultural misunderstandings, mostly because white people think they're better than black people as a, as a thing. And one of the indigenous people gets shot by Wally King's son, John, played by Bud Tingwell. And one of the, and one of the people that Wally's taken along with him is an indigenous guy 
who speaks the native language there. A guy who's called Blackjack in the movie. Through Blackjack, Wally tells them they've got to move on, but they can't move on to another waterhole somewhere else or another spring or another green patch of land somewhere else because there are other tribes on that land. It's their land. And there are not enough resources, food resources, water resources, to support the larger population. So we're getting a kind of ecological subtext to this movie, made in 1950. And we're also getting a, a more complex understanding of Indigenous disenfranchisement in Australia. For a movie that was made 70 years ago to have that is an incredible thing. And it's one of the things that Chips Rafferty definitely wanted as a part of that. In fact, Ealing and Chips Rafferty wanted to give the leading Indigenous actors of the movie the same pay as the other actors. But the South Australian government, which was, what, what was it, the South Australian Aboriginal Protection Board, wouldn't let them do it. Now, to understand that, you've got to understand this. It wasn't until 1967 that Aboriginal Australians were citizens of Australia. Before that, they were seen almost like livestock. Ten, first 10 years of my life, a lot of my fellow Australians weren't considered Australians. Now, I've marched in support of Indigenous rights a couple of times. I've always supported them. Uh, I grew up partly in Redfern, which is an Indigenous part of Sydney. So I've got a little bit of an understanding of this. I've been to rural areas. I know several um, Indigenous people myself, which is kind of rare for Australians, given the fact that Indigenous Australians are only 2% of the population. But they're punching well above their weight now. We're really starting to see an acknowledgement of the fact that this country was settled without the approval of the native people. The land was never seceded to the white people. And this movie goes into that in a, a morally complex way. It really does show both sides of things in a way that's not necessarily as nuanced as it would be were this a modern film. But it is an important piece of the conversation that's at the start of the conversation we are continuing to have with our First Nations people. And that complexity makes it a much more interesting film now than it was in 1950. Now, having said all that, there are a lot of action sequences that work really well in this film. Uh, the location shooting up around Corn and uh, a couple of other places in the Flinders Ranges, which I said I'd been to, and it's a beautiful part of the world. The movie ultimately leads to a climax where the King family and, and their hangers-on confront the local Indigenous tribe, and strangely and kind of contrary to what we know of the real history of Australian settlement, there's a slightly optimistic ending. Now, I kind of like that, but I do know more than a little about Indigenous massacres in Australia, and so I'm kind of glad that there's one story told like that, but there are any number of other stories, which have been told in film as well in subsequent years, that tell the full story of the way that this country was settled by white people. But Bitter Springs, I think, is definitely worth checking out as well. Umbrella have also put that out. These early movies which address the story of white settlement and, and the history of white people in this country are worth treasuring. They're worth watching, they're worth treasuring, they're worth understanding. And I think that they're the start of a rabbit hole of understanding where we want to go as a people in Australia. And people have been polled and Australians really want more recognition for Indigenous Australians. We want to have a treaty with them. We want to have a truth-telling. We want to have an Indigenous voice to Parliament. But the government we have at the moment is not interested in doing that. For me as an Australian, there is so much in, in both of these films that increase my understanding of things and show that the questions and the conversations that we're having now are not new conversations, they're just elaborations on conversations that have been around since 1788 when the first fleet sailed into Sydney Harbour. Revisiting these films is good for me because apart from anything else I can't travel, so seeing broad landscapes and 
hills and mountains and rivers and things like that kind of kept me going a little bit but I think that one of the things I want to do with the channel I'm doing the science fiction I'm doing all the other things that people seem to want but I also want to let people know these kind of hidden gems of Australia's movie past because I think they're definitely worth checking out they're worth having copies of and they're accessible now that for years it was hard to find even a VHS copy of some of these movies but Umbrella Entertainment and companies like that really are serving us well in making the movie history of my nation available to people all around the world so anyway that's it for this time around um, i'm doing a live stream on saturday which i will put in the uh, discussion tab on the channel to let people know around the world what time that's going to happen don't know what i'm doing i've got some ideas for it but i've got to spend the next few days kind of nailing those down but it's going to be another two hour live stream so you can be part of that if you want to Anyway, in the meantime, look after yourselves. Be safe. Watch some good movies. Watch some bad movies. Definitely watch some Australian movies that aren't just exploitation films. And I'll catch you next time.